21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. You left P&G in 2001. What happened next? You know, for me, I'd always thought about going on this entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I was an expatriate, so I was living in Asia at the time. Had finished up a two-year assignment in Hong Kong, was a, a year in Thailand, traveling all throughout Asia. And, and as an expatriate, especially in the countries I was working in, you kind of get that entrepreneurial bug. You're not working in a cubicle the way you were back in the States. It really is kind of engaging. But the company was looking for a couple thousand volunteers. take packages, especially expatriates, because we were expensive and they were trying to get us to move back. And uh, my wife, who also worked for Proctor, and two other people, we all raised our hands. Surprise, 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 Martin, <laughs> they said yes. And so we used the funding as our angel investor or seed, seed money. So, you know, tip number one to anyone that's thinking about being an entrepreneur, especially in today's day and age, and you're faced with this, I was let go, was given a package. You could take that to survive, and many people have to. You could take that and put it away in investments, or you could say, wow, I just received 20, 50, $100,000 in a severance package. That's like angel money with no strings attached. And we used it, Martin, as angel money and started a shopper marketing, shopper research firm here in Northwest Arkansas, just south of Walmart, working with Walmart suppliers, helping them be successful at Walmart. But, but the Proctor severance package was really our angel funding. You started with 100K and was it leap of faith? Was it based on your experience? Yeah, well, in, in um, since I wasn't 23, I was actually 37. Mm -hmm. I had a wealth of experience and I knew, and again, this is talking to, to people who are listening to your show. I knew that being successful in something wasn't going to be as difficult as I thought. I knew I could somehow survive. So survival, I wasn't stressed. I knew I could be a survivor, right? The question I had to answer, Martin, and, and starting out was, did I have an idea or a product or a service that was going to not only let me be successful in being able to survive, but it would let me be significant, something I could grow and build a company. And the good news is the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So we started to build out a company. And then um, I tell people about Field Agent is that it's really a you know 12 year overnight success story, right? Mm -hmm. 12 years to, to make this thing work. But the first 10 years of my entrepreneurial mm -hmm. career was working on different companies, more of a lifestyle business where Rick had to do consulting or Rick had to be in the boardroom. But Field Agent in 2010 was the first idea that we have, a, a, an idea, to, a solution to a problem that I could scale that didn't require me to be in a meeting, that didn't require me to be a part of it. I could actually scale something. And that's when we knew we had something pretty exciting. growth was it uh, organic growth fast growth what kind of growth yeah so within the uh, the first 10 years of the entrepreneur career it was very much controlled growth because uh -huh. I, I had certain capacity and i could only take on so many clients until i could train another person to do marketing work research work but with field agent it's it wasn't a huge hockey stick but it was the hockey stick effect in that i now had people buying our product sight unseen, and I can have 10 people buy today, whereas in the past, I could probably handle one person a month to get them really onboarded and coming in. So for the first time, having tech-enabled solution, mm -hmm. I could see how you could scale it. And that's when, Martin, we all realized we had something really, really good. Can you go a little bit deeper into your business model? Sure, sure. So if there's people listening today, uh, we're based in the United States, but we also operate in you know seven other countries. Uh, if you go to the 
Google Play Store, you go to the Apple Store, you can find an app called Field Agent. It's the little orange app with a white tie on it. And um, the user part of it is all based on mystery shopping, secret shopping. So you're out and about, you're shopping, and you're taking pictures of pricing inside of a store, you're answering questions. Uh, we provide products for you to purchase and get reimbursed for for trial. We have people that do ratings and reviews and get paid for them. So when we launched in April 2010, we were the first app on iTunes that paid you cash. Now, Martin, that's hard to believe today, but remember this is pre-selfie. No front-facing camera, no video, iPhone 3S, two megapixel camera. So it was those days. Now on the other side, if you're a client of ours, you're using us because you need photography at scale, you need pricing information at scale, you're trying to be in a thousand locations and you need to understand today was the display up. You need to have people try your product across the United States or in Canada or in Spain or in Af South Africa. And you need to have people try your product real fast. Well, we have scale there. Or I need 500 ratings and reviews. I need them immediately. So we provide scale and we do that, Martin, through a marketplace. So in today's world, we're, we're, we're the... I would argue the first B2B marketplace that has taken services and productized them so that you can click, click, answer questions, go to a cart and check out. Hmm. So our marketplace isn't a click, get a phone call from field agent and have three meetings. It is go to the product. I want to buy ratings and reviews. I click it just like I was on Amazon, answer a few questions, click, it goes to a cart the swipe or credit card, or if you're a large enough client, we have purchase orders and invoices, we'll invoice you. And so without talking to Rick, you can log in today. If you're sitting in Croatia, as an example, and you said, I have products in the United States that are selling, and I don't know how people use them in their home, or I need people to try my product. While you're sitting in Croatia today, you can go into our marketplace and click, 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 swipe or credit card, in a matter of hours, I'm going to give you data back that tells you exactly what's going on in the United States, and you never have to talk to Rick. So our marketplace is pretty exciting. What kind of technology are you using? Part of it is you, you start out with, everyone thinks the power in this is the app. And you and I both know you can find a kid in high school that could generate an app that would take a picture. I mean, that that's not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is really, uh, we're a Python shop, okay? Everything's in the cloud. We started building that way. And so the secret sauce really gets into how do you take a request and be able to productize it? How do you take a service and productize it such that the user interface allows you to answer those questions to go execute and get some data back or to execute a ratings and review. So that's secret sauce A. The next piece is because we're doing literally tens of thousands of transactions every week, you have to have a very robust QC. You have to have really good quality control. You have to have algorithms in place. You have to have image recognition. I mean, machine learnings. And so that's 12 years of machine learning, right? 12 years of image recognition. So that if someone gave me 5,000 pictures today in near real time, I have validated where they're from. I validated it's the correct photo. I've tagged it. I've quantified it. I've put it in a either a presentation or a dashboard and all that's near real time. So that's the technology that we have that's behind of this, oh, well, it's just a simple app company. That's far from being what we are. The security issue, if everything is in cloud due to the new realm we have, at least in Europe, regarding Russia and everything that is going on, right. cyber wars, uh, how did you manage uh, to develop your security system? Well, there, there's two facets to that. The first is, if I go back to the, if I go back 20 years ago and I had my own server, think of how risky and liable that would be to have to, to deal with all these threats. And someone says, oh, well, you would get some software. I was like, no, 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 it's, it, it'd be really, really difficult. So 
Uh, let's use photos as an example. I'm depending upon Amazon's AWS to be able to thwart the crazy bombarded Russia security threat going after Amazon. And I'm part of their security. Okay. Wow. So I'm counting on them. When I look at the other, like Linode as a server. And so we have all of our servers. We've got 20 around the globe. And so for, Lin- for, for people in Europe, uh, actually, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to say it, but it's uh, in a lot of yeah. articles. CIA is using Amazon servers as well. So it's yes. very, very secure. Very, very secure. And so we have Linode and that would, that would hold our servers for our data. Well, I'm counting on Linode, obviously, to be able to have that first layer of security. Then what I do is our team, then we have the second layer of security where we're doing the same checks that Amazon would be doing because people have figured out a password or tried to play around. And so we have that second layer of security that, that we're focused on. And some of that, again, gets back to machine learning. If this and this happens, that's outside the norm. We've done it for 12 years. And that brings a an alert that says, wait a minute, why would we have someone from the Ukraine or Russia buying this when we don't have services there? And why would that money be sent to an account that we've never used before? So part of it is just basic logic, Uh but you have to have robust enough systems that you're doing that in real time, because if you wait too long, then you're out hundreds or thousands of dollars by the time you figured out there's a problem. Internally, are you agile project management based or something else? Yeah, pretty much. We, we run on uh, two-week sprints. So sprints are driving in, two weeks we're running. Uh, for the most part, uh, we would use most off-the-shelf tools, um, how we capture data, you know, where things go, and how we do project management. Uh, traditionally, we, we've got product owners, and then we have engineers, and each one of the product owners has a like a business unit, kind of external facing, internal, and they're driving the projects. And we lay that out on these two week sprints because um, we're we have enough things changing in our world that even for me to plan out three months is almost ridiculous. Now I have to have a three month plan, but for me to be executing that far, I mean, we've had ten changes, you know, this week of something that'll impact us. So we have to kind of be agile. You have to look at a couple of weeks out. And we feel like that's a really a pretty good rhythm. And we're choosing not to release every day. There really is kind of still a release date, QC, but it's in two week increments. And that's that's worked out really well for us. So Rick, you as a leader, what kind of leadership do you prefer? Oh my goodness. I'll get in trouble for this one because my team <laughs> might be listening. And what if I am I fibbing a little bit here? Yeah. Um, I I think if I've learned anything along the way, Martin, um, is number one, to be significant and to be a leader, you have to realize it's all about people. We're in the people business. And we could argue that you could find another developer, another engineer, and just who cares who quits and bring them in, but that's not the case. So uh, we're people focused. So my leadership is treat people well, let them be a part of the solution, but more importantly, give them something bigger than themselves to shoot for. And it's not that you're working for Rick, but man, when I look at field agent and they understand the technology and what we're trying to drive in this marketplace, that's a really cool thing to be a part of. I think on the culture side, uh, the same thing, we're you know faith-based, we, we want to give good to the community. And so they realize that not only are you engaging in a really cool technology and and it it sounds really cool but more importantly what i'm doing impacts people in the community people in the world and we give plenty people plenty of time to engage in where their passion is so leadership style would be setting big direction here's where we're going making sure people are trained and rewarded and respected and if we put those two things together we have a pretty good organization kind of moving down the path. And we've got about 100 full-time folks right now. Any social activities? Yeah, so let's take it in terms of, uh, we'll do work days. We've got a nonprofit that shares some space with with us. And uh, they have a warehouse that collects goods and they resell those. 
And so we'll have a work day and we'll say, hey, half the team will go in the morning, half the team in the afternoon, and we'll go help and work. We've got another nonprofit we work with that helps young women uh, that are homeless and they're destitute. They're trying to work their way out of that. And so we would go in and help work on the home, we engage. Uh, we've got another organization uh, that's called Life Source, and that Life Source is really giving people a hand up versus a handout, and they need people to help process things. So we provide opportunities so that the organization can engage. But Martin, we're also very, very um, focused, and this gets back to leadership style, that this is not a corporate down, this is an employee up. Mm -hmm. So the three examples I gave you, the reason we support those is because our team was already involved in and supporting them socially. And so since they're involved, them will be involved, but we do not have a corporate focus pushing down. It's all up and we support out. When I think of that business model we have in front of us, and a lot of people ask this question, Martin, they'll say, well, Rick, well, do you have like a thousand employees like manually doing all these things? And I tell them that don't over tech your solution, but after a period of time when you've got people manually doing things, you should be able to automate most things. And so our CTO would come in and say, Rick, this is basic machine learning kinds of things. These are basic algorithms. And so as you think about scaling your business, you've got to have a good math person, data scientist, someone that understands more than just building an infrastructure, you've got to be able to manage the data and that data at scale will become so overwhelming, you cannot staff it with people. And so we've been really, really blessed to have the right people come alongside us to help us think through, hey, here's the algorithm. This is the this is the this. And the next thing you know, I go from having maybe 100 person hours this week to go resolve a task to nanoseconds, now an algorithm. And as we grow, we continue to ask ourselves the question, do I invest tech early or do I scale with people? And once I get people to a point, then tech comes in and replaces that. And there are times, and image recognition is a great example of this, is that you think image recognition can just happen at scale. And because of the variety that we do, by the time you do the image recognition training, you're off to something new and the value isn't there. So we still do a lot of manual image recognition, but on the data side, highly, highly, highly automated. So that's kind of how we look at data. Another thing is we, we talked about this, Martin, is like, how do people engage us? Uh, I'm a LinkedIn guy, so I loved LinkedIn. And uh, the easiest way for someone to engage me personally, and you'd be surprised how I'd react and how I could re-engage back, is just find me on LinkedIn. I'm the Rick West guy on Field Agent, easy to find me. But if you're interested in really using the power of our marketplace, if you're an e-commerce person, we have great e-commerce products. If you're trying to understand merchandising or you want to do sampling, if you're anywhere in the world and you're, and you're operating some product in the United States, simply go to fieldagent.net, learn about, about us. It's going to click on shop. Once you go into that marketplace, it is so simple and so easy. You'll feel like you're in kind of an Amazon effect and you can just buy whatever product you want, go to the cart, click it out. And I'm going to put a teaser out there. We're getting ready to do phase two kind of of, of our marketplace. We're going to rebrand it, relook at it. And that's coming in June. So in June, now I'm going to give you the exact date because then you're going to hold me accountable. I'll get in trouble. But I want people to look at this and they're going to find that not only are we taking that same marketplace effect, but we've taken it a step further and they're going to see the user interface change, the friction go down. And so we're really excited about the product that we're going to be putting out in June. So, you know, Martin, when I, when I think about our world at Field Agent and, and I, I'm a storyteller at heart, and I kind of like to look back at it to, to kind of walk people through Kind of what a day in the life is like and, and how do you engage and, and I, i'll give you an interesting client story of how they were using us and how we were engaged so we had uh, a client that was out in stores and they're engaging in retail and um, they walked up to the shelf and they've got the, the vice president there with them and they've got the big ceo and the ceo walks into the shelf and they're like 
how long is this competitor being on the shelf? And the guy's like, yeah, I don't know. Now, you and I both know when you go into retail and you're going to show someone a store and you're bringing in your CEO, everything's perfect. And you know all the answers. So then the VP looked at the director and the director was like, I, I, and I was like, so is this in every store? Is the competitor everywhere? What's their pricing? Well, the good news for us is one of our clients who still work for that company did the text message that says, we're in major trouble. I need to know if this is everywhere. <laughs> and by the time they got into their car going to the next store, we came back to them and said, hey, don't worry. We've checked the 50 stores in the market. This is a rogue store. It's a test store. The guy said, you know, we've already done our research. I mean, so I'll tell you that story is to say our reaction time and our scale and speed saved that client's rear because they knew they were kind of in a bind, you know, kind of what's going to happen. Now, on the other, other side of things, which is kind of interesting for us, especially in today's economy, we have a user side mm-hmm. and we have users coming back to us and say, you know, you don't know what it's like. I used field agent and I made an extra $50 a week and that helped put food on my table. Mm-hmm. And you just helped me in a time that I was struggling. Now, no one's going to get rich using field agent on the user side, but we get story after story, Martin, of people saying, I was in a bind. I needed some extra cash. You guys were amazing. Great customer service. Thanks for helping me. And the cash went right into my account and you helped me in a time of need. So I give you those two examples to say part of our ethos, part of who we are is helping. And if we can serve our clients with excellence and we can serve our agents with excellence, Martin, it's been a good day, man. It's been a really, really good day. So that's a little bit about who we are. When I think about the, the world that we're in today and we look at the, the speed and the, just the coverage, the expectations that's in front of people, when you take that to the world of retail, whether you're a quick serve restaurant working in retail, you've got a product, e-commerce, brick and mortar, we know that there are problems that have to be solved and most of them are solved with people working really, really hard. As we look at the work in front of us, especially within field agent on marketplace, we finally have a one-stop shop where people can come in and realize that they can have problems solved at their fingertips. It's just a beautiful thing to say, I can sit behind at my desk and I can engage ratings and reviews. I can engage e-commerce work. I can engage pricing and all that happens in a matter of fingertips in front of a dashboard. And while that happens in front of me, the beauty of it is, is that I know it's been going on for 12 years it's tried it's true it's tested it's really really exciting to see people use their fingertips to get amazing data and quality trial in front of them and so that's what i want people to know about what we're doing at field agent the other aspect of it is you may say rick i'm not a brand person and i just want to make a little bit of extra cash i'm one of the few people that ever be on this podcast that'll pay you cash money so download the app play around with it learn engage make a little extra money on us And would love to have your feedback and let me know what you think. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik.